The scripture lesson is Luke chapter 6, verses 46 to 49. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug deep down and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, I was never a, a big fan of the, the TV show, The Office. Uh, but I realized that it's a, a show that, uh, that many people enjoy watching. And, and uh, actually, I think I may recall Pastor Justin saying during the pandemic that, that uh, he and Sarah binge watched The, the, the Office and, and all, the, um, all the, the episodes over, over the years. Well. There was one episode that I just happened to see that I think has become uh, an epic, um, you know, with, with that series, and it's um, it's the episode where where Michael Scott drives a rental car into a lake. You know, it, it's an issue that he's uh, listening to his GPS and he thinks he's following what the GPS says, and and he drives right in, into a lake. And earlier in the the, the episode. He was bragging uh, about his GPS and, and how accurate it was, and all he had to do was follow it, and, and it seems that uh, he either didn't hear things right or, or it steered in the wrong way. But he was so trusting that because the GPS told him to turn, that's what he did, and he, he drove right into the lake. You know, to be honest, GPS technology is, is amazing to, to me as well. I'm amazed at how accurate it is most of the time, and even, even how it can, can get us in the, in the right lane. But there are some people who are so dependent upon their GPS that, that they don't know how to get uh, any place on, on their own. Can you imagine if we were that trusting of God's positioning system? God's positioning system, God's GPS is the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine if we were so responsive to the Holy Spirit that whenever the Holy Spirit spoke, whatever the Holy Spirit guided us to do, that we did it without hesitation. When it comes to following the, the directions of our God positioning system, you know, so often we think that we know better. We know a shortcut. We know an easier way to, to do things. When it comes to relationships, well, yeah, I know what God said and we should do in a healthy relationship, but, but I can do it differently. You know, the rules don't apply to, to me. You know, it's an issue that, uh, well, I don't need to, to sacrifice for the relationship. I, I don't need to, to be forgiven. Instead of following God's standards of, of honesty and, and integrity, we tend to, to cut corners and, and think that we can, um, can, can gain profit no matter what the, the cost or no matter how we do it. There's a name for shortcuts in life. That name for shortcuts in life is, is sin. The Bible tells us that when we choose sin, Things don't end well. Well, this morning we're consent, continuing our, our sermon series entitled A Jesus-Shaped Life. And would uh, remind you that as a part of this series, we've got, uh, we've got Lenten devotionals, that we've got a few left that are out there on, on the table that are helping to, to take us through the, the various topics during this season. There are connect groups that are happening and small groups that are, are talking about this this Jesus-shaped life. And also we're following the same, same topics when it comes to our sermon series during the, the season of, of Lent. And 
you know, just a reminder that you know, all of the all the material is surrounding things that have been written by Steve Cordell, uh, that's uh, that, that's helping us to to tie all of this to, together. Well, the the greatest and probably the most popular sermon that Jesus ever preached was the Sermon on the Mount. Now, you can find the, the Sermon on the Mount in a more lengthy version in the Gospel of Matthew in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. In the Gospel of Luke, we also find some of those stories out of the, the Sermon on the Mount, although we find them in, in chapter 6 and chapter 11 of, of the book of Luke. Now, Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the, the Mount have, have changed the, the world. For, for the last 2,000 years, philosophers have have studied and, and discussed the, the principles on, on money, on loving enemies, on, on judging others that, that Jesus laid out in, in that sermon. Leaders from St. Francis to, um, to Mahatma Gandhi to, to Martin Luther have, inspired, have been inspired to, to adopt Jesus' teaching and, and talk a, about a peaceful and a nonviolent way to, of living. Maybe Jesus knew many of us would, would, be, would be tempted to his, admire his words rather than act on his words when, when he ended the, the Sermon on the Mount. Because he ended the Sermon on the Mount with a, with a parable that tells about two landowners or two people who, who went out and built a house. And, and Debbie read that parable to us just a, a few moments ago. In the parable, it says that you know, one landowner went out and made plans to, to build a house. He, he made all the, the good preparations. He, he got the loan. He was going to do it right. He, he uh, brought in excavators that, that, that dug down and, and so that they were building on, on solid rock. And uh, it may have been more expense involved in, in him building his house. But when the storm came, when, when the storm came that... Uh, you know, had floodwaters rushing in. He was glad that he had made all the preparations because despite the, the storm that, that came his way, despite the rising floodwaters, his house stood. Now, the, the other uh, person that built a house, they, they cut corners. You know, it was an issue. They didn't worry about excavating. They just found a flat place to, to, uh, to build their house. You know, on a sunny day, the house looked beautiful. It, it looked wonderful. But when the storms came, when the floodwaters rose, it was an issue that all of a sudden the house was not sturdy. It says that it came crashing to the ground. You know, Jesus said that the homeowner who built on, on the rock was like someone who hears his word and puts it into practice. When life gets hard, they're able to endure. You know, however, the man who built without a foundation is like the one who hears Jesus' words and, and does nothing about it. When the storms of, of life come, he was not able to, to stand strong. But the one who was built on a firm foundation, he was able to, to stand those storms of life. It's been said that we know more about what God says than we do what he says. We know more about what God says than we actually do what God says. Why is that? Well, maybe we assume that, uh, that Jesus just set the, the bar too high. You know, he set the, the bar too high in order to, to try and, and stretch us, but he really doesn't expect us to, to live up to, to that standard. Soren, Soren uh, Kierkegaard said, most people really believe that the, the Christian commandments, like love your neighbor as yourself, are, are intended uh, to, to serve kind of like someone that uh, never wants to be late, and, and so they... They set their clock 30 minutes early so that, uh, so that they'll always be on time. You know, trying to, to trick you or, or stretch you into uh, to being better there. 
You know, when I was in seminary, I worked with a, a music festival called Ichthus. And, and I know some people have, in our congregation have gone to Ichthus over the years. I've, I've heard you tell the stories. Some have, have told stories of, of fond memories of Ichthus, and others have shared stories about storms that they endured there and, and remembered and, and, and never want to go back. Um, but, you know, the... Ichthus was a, a music festival that had a, a lot of bands that would play music, and, and it was in my final year that I was working with, with Ichthus that, that the festival had gone pretty well, but uh, we were in the, the, the final day, the, the last evening of the festival, and, and there had been some bands that had played earlier in the day that played their full set and maybe even played an extra song, and, and over the course of the, the day, we were running behind. We had 30 minutes more program planned than we had, um, had time to, to do. And so we had to figure out how were we going to cut things 30 minutes short. And so we decided on a plan that we would talk to the, the last two bands, which were the, the headline bands for, for the festival. And we, since we had 30 minutes to make up, we would ask each of them to cut their sets by 15 minutes. Seemed like a good solution, but the stage manager, you know, talked to us and, and he, he said, you know, uh, performers' egos are pretty big. And even Christian performers' egos can, can be pretty big, and, and um, they're not going to like that, that solution. He said, I'm not going to tell them. You know, you need to talk to them, but sparks are going to fly. You just need to, to be prepared. So... Um, Steve, who was the, the general chairman of, of the festival, it was his job to, to go and talk to the, to the two, um, the, the leads of, of the, those two bands. And, and I went along for moral support to, uh, to help Steve in, in the process. And so we, we went and began to, to talk with the leaders of the bands and, and um, you know, laid it all out. And, and when Steve was done, he paused, you know, we were braced for, for their angry response. And I remember after a pause, one of them uh, spoke up and kind of looked at us over his sunglasses. He said, wow, that sounds like a Christian thing you're asking us to do. Sure, we'll do whatever you need. You know, we were braced for them to respond in some way that was other than Christian. But actually, you know, they lived out their faith. They, they did what they said that, uh, they put into action what they, what they said they believed. Christianity is not a collection of knowledge that's intended to be recited, but it's principles of life that are intended to be lived out. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told this parable of, of the, two, the two builders um, because he didn't want them to just listen to his sermon, but he wanted them to, to put it into to practice. I believe Jesus practiced what he preached also. You know, Jesus said, you know, don't worry about money. Well, he lived his life in, in such a way that, that he trusted God in, in all things and, and believed that his heavenly Father would, would provide for him. You know, even as his enemies crucified him, you know, he, he showed them um, you know, the, his character, showed him how the father wanted him to, to live by, by, you know, by praying for those who, who were putting him to death. You know, Jesus prayed and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus modeled a life of obedience to the father as, as he prayed, not my will, but, but yours be done. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all ways like us, but he did not sin. Because he did not sin, have sin of his own, he was able to become the perfect sacrifice for our sin. We are to, um, you know, this morning as we, we come to a, a time of prayer, I want you to, to give consideration to, to this question. Is there an area of your life where you know what God wants you to do, but you refuse to do it? 
Is there an area of your life where you know what God wants you to do, but you refuse to do it? Now, now the word refuse sounds a, a little strong at that point. You know, maybe I resist, or maybe I just fail to do what God wants me to do. But no, you know, I, I think that when we know what God wants us to do, whether that is uh, knowing by what he has in his word or you know, his Holy Spirit is, is leading us. When, uh, when we know what God wants us to do and we don't do it, then we are refusing to do what God wants. We may, uh, is there an area of your life that you know what God wants you to do, but you refuse to do it? Uh, let, let's get back to our, our Jesus-shaped life topic and, and uh, just remind you that a, a Jesus-shaped life is marked by obedience to God's will and God's ways. You know, obedience is, is the foundation that will prevail during a storm. It keeps us from, from regrets and, and invites the power of God However, he chooses to, to pour that out to, uh, to, to make a difference in our lives. In Jesus' day, the, the, the most dedicated uh, religious leaders were considered the Pharisees. Uh, the Pharisees, they were known for, for keeping all of the 613 laws that were, were in the, the Old Testament. And, uh, and yet Jesus often talked about the Pharisees and said he was not impressed with them. He was not impressed with them for just keeping the, the letter of the law. In, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus said, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus said that, some people were probably wondering, well, how can that possibly be? How is it that I can be more religious than the Pharisees? How can I keep the, uh, the law better than, than the Pharisees? And, and Jesus' uh, teaching at that point was not about trying to keep up with the Pharisees. It, it wasn't about you know, them keeping all the 613 laws, but rather it was about what was in their heart. What, what was coming out of, of their heart you know, was what, what Jesus was, was concerned with. Rule keeping is not God's aim, but transformation of, of our heart is, uh, is what he intends, what, what he desires for each of us. Recently, I heard a, a message from the, the president of the Evangelical Seminary of Ukraine located in Kiev. The seminary professor's name, or the seminary president's name, is Reverend Dr. Ivan Rusin. Now, Dr. Rusin you know, shared that the seminary had opened their buildings and the basements uh, of their buildings as, as bomb shelters for, for the people of, of Kiev. He also talked about how um, they were trying to help people who wanted to, to flee the country. They were trying to, to help them find safe passage out of the, the country. And as, um, as Dr. Uh, as Dr. Rusin was, was talking about their experience there, he said that for years he had taught, taught his students about an incarnational theology. What an incarnational theology is that of being the hands and feet of Jesus, living as the hands and, and feet of Jesus. And he said, because of the experience of, of this war, he said, the idea of an incarnational theology has taken on a, a whole new meaning for him. You know, it's a, an issue that, um, you know, being the, the hands and, and feet of, of Jesus, even when they don't know what's going to happen. Being the, the hands and, and feet of, of Jesus, even when they are, are anxious, being the hands and feet of Jesus, even in the face of evil. You know, keeping the rules can never make us holy, but it's only the Holy Spirit 
that, that can transform us, can transform us inwardly in order that we live differently on the outside. The obedience to Jesus is, is not a, about rule keeping. It's a life that, that springs forth with, with a heart that is always willing to say yes. The incarnational ministry of, of Dr. Rusin talked to, about their response to saying yes to Jesus. It wasn't just an issue of caring for themselves, but they had an opportunity or have an opportunity to make a difference in the lives of others. It's incarnational ministry that's being done by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And as the Holy Spirit leads them and guides them, they're willing to say yes. Now, we won't be shaped deeply into the image of, of, of Jesus by learning more or learning one more Christian catchphrase. But we need to, to, we need to cooperate with God's Holy Spirit in, in bringing about transformation in our life. We're, we're called to, to renounce sin. And, and the issue of renouncing sin in our, in our lives is, is the act of saying, I, I'm done with doing what is not pleasing to God. And I want to turn in the opposite direction and, and say yes to God. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to, to fill us because as we talked last week from Galatians chapter 5, it, it says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the sinful desires of the flesh. The Holy Spirit helps to shape us more into the image of, of Jesus as he works on our inside. And then what's going on inside flows out through the power of his Holy Spirit as we live how he wants us to, to live. The Holy Spirit points us in, in the direction that, that we need to change. As I started this morning, I, I talked a, about the a GPS, the Global Positioning System, and, and it helps us to, to figure out where we need to go. But when it comes to our God's positioning system in our life, you know, it's an issue that we need to be responsive to, to, the, to the leading of, of the Holy Spirit. You know, my, the GPS in, in my car, if I make a wrong turn, it doesn't scold me, but it gently says, turn around when possible. Or it will say, make a U-turn. Now, I may feel scolded at, at that point, but I mean, it, it does it in a very calm voice, trying to help me to, to change my direction to get where I, I want to be. Well, God's positioning system, the, the Holy Spirit, you know, <clears throat> helps us to, to know when we need to turn around, when we need to, to make a, a U-turn, when we need to, to head in a different direction. And as we sense God's Holy Spirit speaking to us, are we willing to say yes without hesitation? Our memory verse this morning comes from Luke chapter 6, verse 46. It says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Jesus did not come to, to deliver a, a set of rules for us to follow, but he came so our lives might be transformed and that we might more fully reflect the character of Jesus from the inside out. And the good news is that we don't have to do it on our own. The Holy Spirit is there. The, the Holy Spirit is our, is our GPS. The Holy Spirit is, is our guide. And our job is to say yes whenever the Holy Spirit leads. Let's pray together. Lord, in, in this day, as your Holy Spirit leads, may, may we respond without hesitation. Lord, as your Holy Spirit prompts that we need to make a U-turn in life, Help us to turn around. As you call us to be your hands and feet in the world in, in which we live, may we not hesitate, but may we always say yes for your kingdom's sake. Through Christ our Lord we pray.